Hi everyone, welcome to Epic Chess, the channel that helps you improve your chess fast. In today's video we're going to be looking at the important positional concept of fighting for a key square in the position and we're using a game here played between Garry Kasparov with the white pieces and Alexei Shirov with the black pieces and this game was played in the 1994 Credit Swiss Masters. So Garry kicked off with e4 and Shirov responded here with c5 going into the Sicilian. We had knight f3, pawn to e6, d4, cd, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, knight bd5, looking to jump into this d6 square, d6, bishop f4, putting more pressure there. And now here, Shirov decides to play pawn to e5. This is a committal move in the Sicilian, but one that's been seen many times. And although now this d5 square has been weakened with this pawn push, Black does gain time against the bishop and also creates quite a dynamic position. We've seen Magnus Carlsen recently playing these pawn structures, most notably in his World Championship match with Fabiano Caruana, and he's had very good success there. So we do know that these positions can be very good for Black, but the downside of playing like this is that because you've weakened this d5 square, if you're not careful, you can be positionally lost very early in the game. So here, Gary now jumps the bishop into g5, and we can see why this move is so logical. We're pinning the knight to the queen and we're actually looking to trade this knight off for this bishop because of the fact that we then remove a key defender of this d5 square. So Shirov now plays a6, kicking the knight on b5. It drops back. And although this knight looks a bit dim on the edge of the board right now, it does have plans to reroute itself back into the position, potentially into e3, where it can then hop into d5. And for this reason, Black now plays pawn to b5 to stop that knight immediately jumping into c4. Kasparov now jumps into this d5 square with his knight. We have bishop to e7. And now that this pin has been broken against the queen, this is where Gary now swaps the bishop for the knight. So he plays bishop takes on f6. And again, once you understand the positional concept here of fighting for this d5 square, then that trade becomes very, very logical. So Black recaptures. We have pawn to c3 making way for the knight to come back in this direction, also taking control of this d4 outpost. Bishop to b7 from Shirov, knight c2. And now we have knight to b8, a rerouting manoeuvre, looking to come into d7 and then potentially later c5. So Kasparov plays a4, looking to undermine this queenside structure. We have pawn takes on a4, rook recaptures, knight d7, rook b4. Now this is an interesting move. A more common way to play here would simply be developing the white squared bishop and getting castled, but Kasparov has a really nice positional idea in mind, so he plays rook to b4, and we'll see in a moment exactly what he's planning to do. So Shirov plays the knight into c5, and this is where Kasparov unleashes a brilliancy. So if you want to pause the video here and have a think about what Kasparov played, then please do so. Kasparov now chops the bishop on b7. Rook takes b7. A beautiful exchange sacrifice, recognising the fact that control of this d5 square is key here. And so by removing this light squared bishop, he's now gained control over this light square of d5 and the light squares on the board in general. So Shirov recaptures. We now have b4 clamping down on the knight outposts. And this is the other really nice thing about this position is that because the knight was forced to recapture, it now can't come to a5 or to c5 because this pawn is blocking the jumps. And it's not very easy for the knight to reroute into the game any other way. The queen is going to have to move to then free up the d8 square for the knight to come back into the game somehow. And of course, that all takes time. So that's what Kasparov is playing for here. The control of this key d5 square. And also, he's got a nice initiative now which he can build upon. So we have bishop to g5 for Shirov. He'd love to trade this bishop off if he could to get rid of what is his bad bishop here on the same colour complex as his own pawns. But unfortunately, there's no knights on these dark squares yet. And so the bishop is just hitting into thin air here. And that's really the problem here. Although Kasparov has given up the exchange, both of Black's minor pieces are badly placed or not doing very much. And so this is one of the big differences in the position. So we now have knight to a3, and this is a really nice manoeuvre, just playing around black's bishop, not letting Shirov exchange that bishop by playing the knight into e3, for example. We have castles from black, knight into c4, pawn to a5, looking to get rid of that weak pawn and start to undermine what white is doing with the pawns. 
Of course, we would never capture this because then we give up the c5 square where the knight wants to jump into. So now Kasparov develops his light squared bishop with bishop to d3. We have pawn takes, pawn recaptures, queen to b8, looking to activate the queen and also reroute this knight into the game. Pawn to h4, kicking this dark squared bishop. And again, this is a nice way for Kasparov to carry on seizing the initiative. Rather than just simply castle, he's looking to activate his king side in this way and potentially start to undermine the black king side if given the chance. He also puts the question to this dark squared bishop, where do you want to go to? And Shirov drops the bishop back to h6 here. And what we notice about this is suddenly this e7 square has become weak now. So where this d5 knight was already a monster, it's now even more of a monster because of the fact that it has this extra jump into the position. Possibly it could even come into f6 if we imagine a queen on g4 pinning this g pawn against the king. We now have knight c to b6 from Kasparov hitting the rook. The rook jumps into a2. Now looking at this d2 square supported by the bishop on h6. We have castles now from Kasparov. Rook to d2. And now a nice reply, simply queen to f3. Holding on to that d3 bishop and also now starting to activate the queen and bring it into the danger area. We have queen to a7, again looking to invade down the a-file and come to the seventh rank. Kasparov now jumps into d7, hitting the rook on f8. And here actually Shirov finds the positional squeeze to be just too much and he drops his knight into d8, looking to bring that piece back into the game and give back the exchange here. And after this, now Kasparov is really just much better. So he chops off that rook, king recaptures, and now we can see that not only is the material level, but Kasparov has a huge positional advantage with a monster knight on d4, a pass pawn on b4, a raging attack still against the black king. And so I don't think this decision was very good by Shirov because now he's just worse for no compensation at all. At least if we run back to this position here, he does have the exchange. And so even though he's suffering positionally, I think a better move here would have been to play rook to a8, trying to activate that rook, and saying to white, okay, you can jump in and give this check. And after the king is forced to move away and queen captures here, even though this looks scary, there is a draw line here, which the computer finds. Now, maybe Shirov didn't see this in the game, which is why he didn't go for it. But after black captures on d3, white can now jump the knight into f8, threatening checkmate on g8, supported by this knight on e7. But now the queen can jump into a2 and it defends against that checkmate all the way from behind down this diagonal. And white would have to give ground here, drop back into f5, again threatening checkmate on h7, supported by this knight. So we'd get g6. And say we throw in the check here, bishop blocks. We now have nothing better with white but to force a draw here by chopping this g6 pawn with the knights. And basically, white can continue checking black. So after the king jumps up, White drops into f5 again, and between queen and knight, it's not possible for black to escape these checks. And it should be noted that the queen and knight are very good attackers together, so always look for that combination in your own games. If you can get the queen and knight into the danger zone around the king, they work very effectively together. So coming back here, Shirov played knight to d8, Kasparov chopped off the exchange, king recaptures, pawn to b5, simply pushing that other asset down the board now, queen into a3, hitting this bishop, and now a really nice response from Kasparov. Even though that bishop is threatened and pinned to the queen, Kasparov has seen that because the black pieces are so uncoordinated here, and the king is also looking a little unsafe, he can actually ignore this threat and play queen into f5. A really nice move. So if black takes this rook, then the queen now comes into d7, and it's a silent killer move. The threats are too much here. If black tries to save the knight by, say, knight to e6, then we simply have mate in two with queen to c8, and the knight has to jump back and block. So in this position, that's why Shirov has to respond to Kasparov's threat, and he plays king across to e8 to stop the queen invading. So now Kasparov saves his bishop, bishop to c4. We have rook to c2, hitting that bishop. And again, now Kasparov just meets Shirov's threat with an even greater counter threat, and if you want to pause the video and have a look at what Kasparov played here, then please do so. Kasparov plays queen takes h7, and now in this position, Shirov does chop off that bishop. Kasparov comes in with the check, and after king to d7, this is really the point of leaving that bishop on c4 undefended. Kasparov jumps in with the knight fork, king moves away, and then he picks up the rook 
And now Kasparov is the one who's actually in exchange up in this position. Shirov jumps back with the queen to c5. We have rook to a1, again leaving that knight undefended. Because if the queen chops it off with queen takes c4, now the rook jumps in with rook to a7. And again, the king is forced to run away. We pick up the knight on d8 and we still have a raging checkmating attack. Black can throw in a couple of checks here, but after king to h2, queen to f4, we can simply run the king to h3 here, and there's no checks possible on g4 or f5. So coming back to here, instead of taking that knight, Shirov plays queen to d4. And now again, if you want to pause the video and have a think about what Kasparov played here, then please do so. He played a silent but deadly move here, rook into a3. He'd like to check on a7, but the queen is still defending that square. And the rook was also attacked, so it had to move. And he's basically saying to black, find a move here, because it's very difficult for black to actually coordinate the pieces and figure out what to do. Shirov tried bishop to c1 hitting that rook again, and now simply Kasparov plays knight into e3. Another really nice counter threat move, because if the bishop takes the rook on a3, then we jump into f5 and we have this nice knight fork picking up the black queen. And if instead the bishop were to chop on e3, then we have rook recaptures, and again this position is just hopeless. Kasparov's the exchange up, he has a pass pawn here, and the black king is still very, very unsafe, staggering around the middle of the board. So a really nice attacking game from Kasparov, and it shows very powerfully how controlling a key square, like this d5 one in this game, can lead to a decisive initiative that wins the game. And I especially love how Kasparov used the exchange sack here to sack the rook from b4 for this bishop on b7, highlighting that light squared domination, which ultimately led to winning this game. So I hope you found this video really helpful. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and I hope to see you again on another video.